say. So why don't you pray with me as we get into this Bible study. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is powerful. It is alive, it is active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. It does a supernatural work in our lives spiritually, but there can also be some physical manifestations of what happens when we obey your word and we take heed to your word. So would you speak to us now? We wanna humble our hearts before you. Father, as your mouthpiece today, would you fill me with your spirit afresh? Would you speak to your people? Would you comfort those who are in mourning? Would you challenge those who've become dull? Would you humble those who become exalted? Would you exalt those who have been humbled? Would you do your perfect work today in all of us through this word? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give it up for the worship team, by the way. Thank you guys so much. Powerful, powerful worship set. So we're gonna be in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 today, so you can open up there in your Bibles. And while you're opening there, I want you to think about this question. Would you say that you are a disciplined person? There's people laughing because they're probably like, nope. And don't be nudging your, your spouse if they're not the disciplined person in the relationship. Discipline, there's something, you know, especially in a church context, if I can be frank, when we talk about discipline, there's a lot of different emotions that rise up in people. Some people are like, yeah, I love discipline, let's take them out. That's like PT, like he loves discipline, he's a disciplined guy, he's a consistency guy. Some people, when you hear discipline, you're like, oh, not another message about discipline. We take this disdain for discipline into our spiritual walk, which we're gonna talk about a little bit today, but I wanna just, I wanna implore us, let's, let's humble ourselves in regards to this concept of discipline for a moment. Let's take it out of biblical context, let's take it out of church context and Christian context. My question is, do you want a disciplined pilot or an undisciplined pilot? Probably a disciplined pilot, right? Think about it, when they're in the cockpit, I mean, Al Grosskirth, he, he probably knows this better than most people because him, Tony Underwood, these pilots in our, in our team. But when you're in the cockpit and you're, you're flipping, I don't even know what these switches do, right? You ever like look in the cockpit, you're like, I, I mean, everyone would be dead if I was in that seat right now, right? It's like all these different switches, all these different gauges, and they have someone in their ear and they're like, they're going through this checklist and they're making sure everything is dialed in and everything's done correctly, right? When you're on a plane and you start feeling the turbulence, you're grateful for a disciplined pilot, right? How about a disciplined surgeon? Would you prefer a disciplined surgeon or an undisciplined surgeon? Disciplined, yes, disciplined surgeon, right? Even down to the details of washing your hands correctly, right? If you don't wash your hands correctly, it could lead to infection which could lead to a whole series of issues, including death. Police officers. I mean, there's a whole, like you could turn on the news, especially, uh, I won't say it, but you could just turn, turn on the news pretty much any time of the year and there's gonna be some sort of conflict going on with civilians and police officers and the question comes down to, do these police officers have the discipline necessary to do their jobs, right? We want disciplined police officers. We don't want undisciplined police officers. Engineers. If we had undisciplined engineers build this building, this roof would cave in on us. We want discipline. We want, let me say this. We want the results of discipline. We oftentimes don't want the cost of discipline. One thing that I'm thinking about a lot in our culture these days especially if you're, if, you're, if you're on social media for more than 30 seconds, you might scroll through like your Instagram reels or TikTok videos and you might see that there's this, there's like this, uh, it's almost like the religion of the world is like non-religious spirituality. How many of you have ever heard or said, you don't need to raise your hand, I'm not a religious person, I'm a spiritual person. 
I would assume most of us have heard that. And some of us even feel that way. And I can tell you as someone who has been that way and struggles to stay out of that mindset. But what does that mean? What, do, what are we really saying when we say, I'm not a religious person, I'm a spiritual person? What we're really saying is, I recognize that there's more to this world than what I can touch, see, hear, smell, but I still wanna be in control. I wanna be God. I want it my way. I want my Christianity like Burger King. I want it my way. I don't want other people to tell me what to do. I don't wanna submit to other spiritual leaders. I don't wanna be a part of an institution. And I can understand why we would feel that way to a certain degree because people, even people in leadership, were fallen, were broken. We're gonna read about a guy who was a tremendous leader, King David. He drifted away from his spiritual disciplines and it wreaked havoc over the entire nation. But it also communicates to me that, you know, we have personal responsibility in this thing. Like we can't just blame people who've abused power, people who've abused authority and said, you know what, because they did that, I'm just not, I'm not gonna submit myself to authority anymore. If anyone in here would be frustrated about what's happening in culture right now, let me tell you what's happening. We are an undisciplined culture. We have rejected discipline. We have rejected structure. I was just at a, uh, it, was, it was a public school board um, forum the other night for the Elkhorn uh, school board candidates. And what was amazing to me, I was sitting next to my, my mother-in-law, the questions that were being asked about, you know, should, uh, and by the way, I'm not casting judgment, I'm just saying, here's, here's the facts, here's objectively what people are curious about, here's what the conversations are in our culture these days. Do you support transgender, transgender men playing on women's teams? Do you support this explicitly sexual curriculum in our school libraries or not? Do you believe that teachers should be armed and carry guns to protect these students? Wherever you lie on the, on the political spectrum, on the social spectrum, that's not my point. The point is, is that I'm sitting in this school board forum and I turn to my mother-in-law and I say, what's happened? That these are the conversations that we're having and these are not fringe conversations. These are mainstream conversations. What that communicates to me is that we as a culture, as a society, as a people, have rejected structure, have rejected the discipline of God. And the discipline of God, where we're, we're gonna see, he's not this ogre in the sky that's just looking to steal our joy. He creates structure, he creates a disciplined environment so that we can thrive. I was backstage and I was, I was praying and the Lord gave me this phrase, Cap, the only difference between a wilderness and a garden is structure. The only difference between a wilderness and a garden is structure. Same materials, same plants, same fruit, same dirt, same rocks, same sun, same water. The only difference is structure. Someone came into that wilderness, put structure in things, restricted some things and allowed other things to flourish and now you have an ecosystem that's conducive for life. For life, not death. For joy, not depression. No wonder we're experiencing such record high depression and suicide in our culture. Because we're so undisciplined. We reject discipline. I wanna share just a brief story because it's, it's so personal to me. I was, when I had just gotten saved, I was, um, I went through this program called Patmos. It was uh, at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. Amazing, amazing church. Actually, this church exists because of the investment from Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale in Pastor Todd and Denise. And so I went through this program. It was a four-month discipleship program. We joke and call it Bible College Meets Survivor because it really was, it was 
pretty intense, and I signed an NDA, so I can't tell you exactly what happened there. Uh, but it was, it was amazing. God spoke in tremendous ways, and I was humbled like crazy. And uh, I, Basically, the whole point of it was radical dependence on the Holy Spirit and also just learning, being you know, taught a lot, studying a lot. It was, it was a really remarkable experience for my faith journey. It was an accelerator. But when I was there, the, the term that I was there was a term that was, uh, the semester I was there, I should say, was so unique compared to every other semester that existed in Patmos because I was there behind the scenes, a new Christian going through this discipleship program. I was there when the lead pastor of this magnificent megachurch had a horrible fall into sexual immorality. And he lost everything. And you look at this guy who you even, uh, a tremendous man of God. I mean, he, he, the Lord used him in such amazing ways. And if you were to even go back and watch his last messages that he was giving before everything came out into the open, he was dialed in. He was preaching well, his, his teachings were strong, and it just, to me, it's, it's, it's like, I can't wrap my head around it. How can someone be so used of God in such a mighty way, even to the end, and then all of a sudden, everything gets taken away from them? And I don't know this guy personally, and I'm not casting judgment, but I know for a fact that the Lord called me there, and even the, the program director said to our class, he, he said, the Lord has you here for a reason to learn a very important lesson. None of you are invincible. And all it takes, we're gonna, we're gonna go over these three points, all it takes is a little bit of drifting to become deceived and then to need some severe discipline. You can kind of wrap up this message in this title. The title is Stay Sharp. In the days that we're in, God is looking for spiritual people. Don't get me wrong. God doesn't want us to have this very rigid relationship with him where it's like, yes, sir, no, sir, and there's, there's no heart. He's a father. He wants, he, he wants that intimate relationship with his kids. But I love this divine tension that we see in scripture in our spiritual lives where we are not only compelled by the love of God, but we're also, there's gotta be this healthy fear of the Lord as well. We just read it in Proverbs chapter one. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need both. We can't just live in this place of, of, of cashing out on God's grace and making grace a license to sin. No, we are saved, we're redeemed, we're a royal priesthood, we're transformed, we're brand new, and now we gotta act like it. Now we need to start imposing some, some healthy restrictions on our lives so that we can continue to flourish like a garden and not go crazy like a wilderness. We're gonna get into 1 Chronicles 21 in a second, but let's start with, let's, let's do a little bit of summary on 1 Chronicles 17 through 20 real quick, okay? So if you're familiar, if you were reading the daily readings, David, he's the king at this time, and David is... He's a boss, someone say a boss. He's not a boss, he's a boss. There's a W in there. David, <laughs> David is that guy, he's that dude. He's the guy you want on your team. I love, anyone like just love leadership lessons? I love, I love following great leaders and just learning about great leadership. And you look at David and, and David is this man after God's own heart. He's, he's uh, even in that, the, the time before he was king, he started winning the loyalty of all of these mighty men around him. Guys who were literally like, bro, I would take a bullet for you. I would die for you. I'll go wherever you wanna go because you're a leader worth following. And I just look at a guy, I'm like, how does someone create that level of loyalty? Well, it's because he's a man of integrity. It's because he's a man of humility. He puts God first in all things. He puts other people before himself. He's courageous, he's strong, he's also creative, he's a musician, he's a poet. He's got like the whole package. He's like that guy in high school, you're like, you just wanna hate them because they got everything going on, but they're also super nice and you're just like, I wanna hate you, but I can't, you're just too nice. David's that dude. He's that boss, the boss. David becomes king 
And David is, you know, he's leading his, his uh, army of Israel into all these battles. And what's so cool about David is David, he gets his marching orders directly from God. You remember that? Like, you see how he prays? He'll go into a battle. He's not presuming on God's grace. He'll ask, he'll say, God, how do we handle this battle? How do we handle this enemy? And God, this is what's so cool. You can take this down even for your own, for your own prayer life. God is interested in the details. God is not only present on a Sunday morning when you come and you open your Bible and you sing these songs. God cares about your business. God cares about how you cook a recipe for your family. God cares about how you're homeschooling your children. God cares about how, how the plays that you're running for your sports team. God cares about the details. And when we invite him into those details and say, God, how would you do this? Not in a way of like freakishly, fanatically, where it's like, God, what should I eat for breakfast today? Or is it okay to cross the street? Like he wants to level us to this place of maturity where we can use our free will and experiment and explore with him but he loves being invited. He loves being invited into those details. And so here David is, he's inviting God into the details of war and God is giving him very specific marching orders. I love it. He's not vague. He's not the author of confusion. He's the author of clarity. But over time, David started racking up a lot of wins. He started racking up, like pretty much he was just winning all of these battles. And what you see happen over time is that when David begins winning these battles, it's not a very explicitly written thing in scripture, but there is a pattern I want you to observe if you've been reading these stories. He goes from consulting God directly to needing to have men of God, prophets, consult to God for him. He has this direct line. It's like you got an ethernet cable, and you're just like, you're just pumping, like the internet's just flowing. You're like, whoa, this is so fast. And then all of a sudden, if you, if you have internet in here, which would, I would hope would be everybody, you know the difference between ethernet versus, I don't know why, like I'm just like plugging in the top of my head. Ethernet versus Wi-Fi, like those are the antenna, right? Like, you know the difference. There's just a significant difference when you're plugged into the source and you're kind of like around the source, right? And so you see this pattern in David where now he's consulting other people and then you see this pattern of him doing things without anyone's counsel at all. He's just doing what he thinks makes sense to him. Even things that would be good. Remember, he's like, I'm gonna build God a temple. You know, the presence of God, we've built this really cool tent and everything and the ark of the, of the presence of God we'd, we'd take in there. But you know what? God doesn't deserve a tent. God deserves a temple. Let's go build a temple. And the guys were like, yeah, let's go do it. And then this one prophet, I think it was Nathan, Nathan goes and consults God. And then God's like, uh, I did not tell him to do that. Please tell him to not do that. And Nathan's like, oh, snap, okay. And then goes and tells David like, bro, like uh, chill a little bit. God doesn't want you to build the temple. He's gonna build it through your son, Solomon. And so, but, but the point that I'm trying to make is that David begins presuming on the grace of God because of past victories. Let me tell you real quick, the greatest threat to our future spiritual success is our past spiritual success. Because what happens when we're walking in blessing and we're walking in victory is it's just human nature, unfortunately. We just get comfortable, we start praying less. I got this, I've done this before. I don't need to prepare as much we begin drifting. Someone say drifting. David began drifting from his disciplines. There's two things that I feel like is, are pretty evident that David was decreasing in his life. First one was prayer, which we just talked about. Direct communication with God, consulting God, asking God what he thinks, and then the reading of the word. Why would I assume that David is falling away from his discipline of reading in the word? Well, check this out. You can write this down as a note. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, scripture is really clear. Whoever would become king, there's two things that, need, that he needs to do. He needs to, number one, he has to copy the entire law of God by hand, like basically create his own little Bible by hand in the presence of the, Le the Levitical priests. The accountability, they're basically showing like we are witnesses that this guy has read every word, he's written every word, he, is, he has no excuse 
of not knowing what the word of God says. And then the second thing, he's to read that word every single day of his life. It doesn't say how much, it doesn't say how little, but he is supposed to read that word every single day of his life. And we see that David delights in this. This isn't like a chore for him. In Psalm chapter one, he says that, you know, blessed is the one who reads the word, who meditates on the word day and night. He's gonna be like a tree planted by a river and he's gonna bear fruit. He or she are gonna bear fruit in every season of life. This wasn't this religious routine for him. This was a delight because he saw the fruit of it. But then over time, he started making these decisions that were like, bro, like if you read the word, you wouldn't have made that decision. Perfect example. You guys remember the story just recently in, the, in, the, in these stories where David's like, we gotta go get the ark of God back, which is basically like this big box. It was this big box filled with all these items that represented like the way that God was faithful to them in the past, like these things that they collected along their journey to the promised land. And he, the, the ark of God had been taken away by the Philistines. And so they're like, okay, we're gonna go get that ark of, of God back. So they, they go and they collect the ark of the covenant and they're all celebrating. The Bible says that they're all dancing with all of their might. Can you imagine what that looks like? I'm imagining like this holy mosh pit. Like they're just like, yes! Like they're so excited to get the ark of the covenant back. And so they're like having this massive party, dancing with all of their might all the way back, and it says that there was this guy named Uzzah, someone say Uzzah. Uzzah. Oh yeah, you guys know, because Uzzah was a, right? <laughs> so Uzzah's carrying this ark, and all of a sudden, he just, he just drops dead. Like, my, like, Wile E. Coyote imagination is like, like, he just like becomes this like pillar of ash and like all this smoke, but David is, David is ticked. David's like, God, what, you're, you're, you're killing our joy, like, party foul, Lord, like, we're doing this, we're doing this for you, and you're gonna kill the guy carrying the ark? Well, if you look back in Levitical law, the only people qualified to carry the ark were the, were the priests, were the Levitical priests. And so David, in a careless mistake, wanting to do the right thing, was not paying attention to the details and it had a catastrophic consequence. Our good intentions only can get us so far. God is looking for obedience. He's looking for us to care about the details. And you know, we're a church that like, we're pretty disciplined about our daily readings. And I'll just say this on behalf of our pastor because you know, some people, and I'll be honest, sometimes in seasons of my life, I struggle. I struggle waking up and reading all, the, all of those chapters and, and I'm like, man, like, is my relationship with God hinging on my ability to perform this task? That's not the point. That's not the heart. God's not like grading you with a rubric, like did you do it today? Like, well, you might get a little bit of favor today and if you did, okay, great, here's all your brownie points. No, God, the heart behind it is, this is a, a simple act of discipline. It could take you as little as five minutes take me as little as five minutes every day, but when we commit ourselves, especially first thing in the morning, to consecrating our mind and our heart to reading the word of God, it changes everything. I can't, I can't even like, emphasize that enough. I can't even unpack that fully. Let me just tell you that it changes everything, and personally, when I drift away from it, I feel the difference. Even just the other day, I missed one day. I just, I kind of slept in a little bit. I, I had a very uh, surface level reading of the word that day. And I just felt it. I was edgy with my wife. I was edgy with my kids. I was impatient. I was confused. And I, and I even had some like stuff come back at me that day that was, it was just some weird encounters with, with individuals. Bottom line is I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared for that day. So the heart of this house with this discipline is not, to, is not to headlock us into this religious routine. It's to create a healthy structure so that we can thrive, so that we can grow, so that we can continue to take the mountain and experience God's best for our lives, amen? Here's a quick question I wanna ask just as a practical application. We have these five S's that we talk about, right? Surrendered, surrounded, spirit-led, self-fed, and sent. Here's a great question that we can just be asking the Holy Spirit this week. Lord, which of these five S's do I need to sharpen in this season? 
Do I need to surrender my mind to you more? Am I just kind of going about my day, just kind of, just not being cognizant of what I'm thinking about? Am I always on my mind? Or are you, are you dominating my thoughts most of the day? Lord, maybe it's my, uh, my self-feeding. Am I reading the word consistently or am I drifting away? Spirit-led, am I, am I committing myself to time of prayer on a daily basis? Sent. I'll tell you this, this is, what's so, this is also so important for us. If we aren't disciplining ourselves to proclaim the word of God, to speak the gospel, to go to people in our spheres of influence and say, hey, how can I be praying for you? If we are not actively being sent, we are becoming dull. We're not being obedient, we're not being fully obedient and it's only a matter of time before we drift and we walk into deception. That's the second point I wanna cover. Someone say deception. David, because of his drifting, ended up becoming deceived. This is what it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses one through six. It says, Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. Pause right there. If you remember, 2 Samuel chapter 24, we see the same story being accounted for. But the author in that story, if you remember, says that God led David to take the census. Okay, just I want you to think about that. We'll come back to that in a minute, but I want you to, to take notice that in this story, it says that Satan did it, and in the previous story, it says that God did it. Verse two, it says, so David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, take a census of all the people of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, may the Lord increase the number of his people a 100 times over. But why, my lord, the king, do you want to do this? Are they not all your servants? Why must you cause Israel to sin? But the king insisted that they take the census. So Joab traveled throughout all Israel to count the people, and he returned to Jerusalem and reported the number of people to David. There were 1,100,000 warriors in all Israel who could handle a sword, and 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include the tribes of Levi and Benjamin in the census because he was so distressed at what the king had made him do. So what was David doing? What's the point of a census? Kings in that time would take a census when they were planning to go to war. It's like, hey, we wanna go take over that nation. We wanna expand our territory. We gotta take inventory of what we got and who's on our team, and who's on our squad. If you can imagine, because they didn't have internet back then, they have this massive country of all these people. People are popping out babies left and right, time passes by, the people are dying. They don't know who, how many people they have left. So taking the census was a 10 month process to see, hey, do we have what it takes to go back to war? But David didn't consult the Lord this time. David wasn't asking God, do you want us to take this census and go prepare for some more battles? In 2 Samuel chapter 24, as I mentioned, it says that God led David to do this. But here it says Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to do this. So who was it? Was it God or was it Satan? I would say, I would submit that the answer is both. And what happens in this scenario is kind of like what we see happen in the book of Job, where Satan comes to God and says, God, Job is only worshiping you because you've given him all this stuff, you've blessed his life. That's the only reason why he's righteous. And God says, okay, you wanna bet? Test him. I'm sending you to go test him. The sovereignty of God allows Satan to go and sift Job. Do you remember when Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I'm praying for you, man because Satan is coming to sift you. The sovereignty of God allows Satan to test us, to try us, and in this moment, the sovereignty of God is allowing Satan himself to deceive David. Why is this significant? This is so significant to me because in my own life, some of, my, some of the greatest heartache I've ever walked through was when I was convinced I was hearing from God but because I was neglecting daily discipline in prayer, because I was neglecting daily discipline in the word of God, because I was neglecting the discipline of being surrounded by wise counsel, I created a gap in my life for the enemy to come in, to whisper in my ear, and to lead me down a path of destruction.
it's super concerning to me today. Not because I would say like, oh, there's so many people in this church that are struggling with this, but, but my fear, my, my fear, my genuine concern is that we can go through life and just and reap up blessing and reap up material possession and reap up favor and not ever ask the question, is this really from God or am I on the wrong team? And am I experiencing blessing to keep me from pursuing the things of God? Am I really leaning in? Am I really hearing God's voice or am I being deceived? This is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter four, verses one through five. It says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Here's the answer. How do we, how do we ensure that we are not walking in deception? And I don't wanna create, guys, God's heart for us is that we're not confused of hearing his voice. He wants us to be confident that we're hearing his voice. But if we are consumed with our own selfish desires, and then we put God's name on what we're doing, God's leading me to this, God's leading me to this girl, God's leading me to this guy. How do you know? Well, I just feel like it. And this happened, and I had this sign, and I opened up my phone, and they texted me right at that moment, and it was a sign from God. Meanwhile, they're, they're leading you in a completely different path. They're leading you completely away from the Lord. I wanna take this job. How do I know it's from the Lord? Because it's gonna make me a lot of money. Meanwhile, the culture there is corrupt, it's conniving, there's gossip. Hey, by the way, God might call you to a, to a place like that so you can redeem that culture, right? But we gotta be very careful when we start allowing our own personal desires to become the voice of God in our lives. We need to humble ourselves. This is what it says in James chapter four, six through 10. It says, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Pur purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, did you see what that promise was? The devil will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what we see happen here in this final part. When David receives, receives the discipline that he needs, he humbles himself and the enemy flees. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse seven through 14, we're gonna come to a close here shortly. Verse seven says, God was very pleased with the census and he punished Israel for it. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by taking the census. Please forgive my guilt for doing this foolish thing. Then the Lord spoke to God, David's seer. This was the message. Go and say to David, this is what the Lord says. I will give you three choices. Choose one of these punishments and I will inflict it on you. Can you imagine? God's like, which, pick your three. Here's the three things I'm gonna discipline you with. And oh my, oh geez, none of these sound that good, honestly. So I'll give you the three choices. Choose one of these punishments and I'll inflict it on you. So Gad came to David and said, all right, these are the choices the Lord has given you. You may choose three years of famine, three months of destruction by the sword of your enemies, or three days of severe plague as the angel of the Lord brings devastation throughout the land of Israel. Decide what answer I should give the Lord who sent me. I'm in a desperate situation. Yeah, no kidding, David replied. They replied to Gad, but let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is very great. Do not let me fall into, into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 people died as a result. 
And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem, and just as the angel was preparing to destroy it, the Lord relented and said to the death angel, stop, that is enough. At that moment, the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Arauna the Jebusite. Oh gosh, I, I, I don't like preaching this stuff, man. Because who, who wants to receive this, this word? Who wants to receive this type of discipline? But was God being mean? Was God being unjust? David didn't think so. David said, I would rather receive the discipline from you, God, than from these people because you're a merciful God. David recognizes in this moment that this is cleansing, brutal, brutal. 70,000 people died because of his foolish mistake. And you know that it hurt him. He even goes on to say, God, please spare these innocent people. They're just sheep, God. This is my fault. Allow this to come upon my family. But God was making a very clear point to David, and I believe he's making a very clear point to us as well. We're called to be the head and not the tail in culture. We're called to lead and not fall behind. We lead through serving, yes, but we're called to be a city on a hill. We're called to be the light of the world. And when we... Stop embracing this discipline in our lives, these daily spiritual disciplines to keep us sharp, to keep us on track. You know what happens? What's happening in the culture is what happens. And Lord, I just wanna ask for your forgiveness for me personally because it's so, it's so tempting to just go out and blame the world, blame the culture. I don't know about you, but before I knew Jesus, I had no clue. I had no grid for what was right and wrong. We're not called to go out and judge the world, but we do need to have a healthy judgment of what's going on inside of the house of God and first with ourselves and say, Lord, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Show me where I've become dull. Show me where I've become deceived. For the sake of them, sharpen me, change me. This is the heart of God that we, that we need to have when it comes to discipline. This is what it says in Proverbs chapter three, verses 11 through 12. It says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, verse 27. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. The simple phrase that the Lord gave me as we close this is, the choice is really ours. We can be disciplined or we can get disciplined. And it's not because God hates us. And it's not because God is mad at us. Can God be disappointed? Absolutely. But at the same time, he already knows all the things that we're gonna do. He already knows all the failures that are gonna come. And he is so committed to us. He is so committed to conforming us into the image of Christ that he disciplines us out of this love. But I, I don't know about you, I would much rather impose the discipline on myself than receive it from the Lord. So Lord, we just come before you right now and we just ask, God, would you humble us would you show us where we become dull? This is specifically for believers in here. This is for the believers in the house of God. Where we've lost our sharpness, we've lost our saltiness, our flavor, our ability to preserve culture around us. God, where we've grown lazy, Holy Spirit, would you just reveal that place to each and every one of us? Husbands, where we've neglected to lead our wives. For wives, where we've neglected to respect our husbands. For the single person in here who's, who's been coveting that season of marriage, who's been walking in impurity, Holy 
Holy Spirit, just do some surgical work right now in our hearts. Just show us. And give us a game plan. Show us what you want us to do. Show us what, what is appropriate in this season to sharpen the blade, to embrace that healthy discipline, and to become the garden of life that you desire for us to be, in Jesus' name. Now, before I say amen, I do wanna give an invitation for those in the house of God. If you hear this message and you're like, you know what, here's, here's what I would say. As a preacher, sometimes the, t the difficult messages, we think that the world doesn't wanna hear them. We think that people who are far from God don't need them, but I'll tell you what, for me as a, as a person who thought that there were many ways to get to heaven, there were many paths, and all those paths lead up to the same destination. It required someone so kind, I mentioned this at the beginning of my message, so kind and so humble to tell me, my brother, there's only one way to eternal life. In John 14, six, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And you might say, well, that sounds extremely exclusive. No, it's extremely clear. And this is the most inclusive religion there is because you could come from any background. You could have done any heinous sin and God says there is room for you at my table, but you cannot do this alone. Your good works will never measure up. The Bible is super clear. None of us are righteous. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We are all guilty before this righteous judge. But this righteous judge that stands before us with our rap sheet of everything we've done wrong is also a good father. He is the spirit of adoption. And he looks at a culture of, orphan, of orphans and says, there's room in my mansion for you. I have a room for you. I want to invite you in. But the request is simple and clear. You need to lay down your life. Jesus made it super clear. Lay down your life for my sake and you will find it. Lay down your philosophies. Lay down your preconceived notion of who God is. Repent before him. Repent is a fancy word for just turning back to God, saying, I'm going this way. The Bible says that we go down one or two paths in life, a broad path which leads to destruction or the narrow path that leads to life. Oh, how few find it, Jesus said. And God's desire for you today is that you would find that narrow path, that you would experience eternal life today, that you would come out of condemnation, you'd come out of fear, you'd come out of judgment, you'd come out of worry, and you'd come into the security of knowing who you belong to and where your destination is secured, that you will spend eternity with him in heaven one day. Let's stand to our feet as we give this moment for people. If you're in that place where you recognize you need this grace, you need this forgiveness, you need this mercy. Jesus made it so simple for us. He was the perfect sinless son of God. God himself came to planet earth to live the life that you and I couldn't live, perfect, holy, healing people, miracles, good, kind, generous. And then wicked people like us crucified him, pinned him to that cross, pinned him to that tree, nailed him through his wrists and through his feet to two planks of wood and let him suffocate on that cross, bleeding out for us. And I just think the Lord gave me this picture about like, how hard is it to play an instrument? I mean, what they're doing, like this is like, I can't even touch that, right? Imagine playing a, a song for 33 years straight and never missing a note. Just think about that. Think about taking a violin and playing a violin for 33 years and never missing a note. And this is what Jesus did when he came to planet earth for us. Because though he wasn't playing a violin, he walked with sinners, he walked with thieves, he was betrayed. And with every thought and with every word and with every deed, he never missed a note. He did the whole thing perfectly. He was never irritable. He was never lustful. He was never greedy. He was so 
disciplined. The disciplined one became sin for us, the undisciplined, to wipe us clean, to pay for our penalty in full and to say, hey, you can't do this without you, without, without this grace. I'm giving you a clean slate. And then by simply believing in me and my crucifixion and my resurrection, I will give you the power of the Holy Spirit who will lead you in this life, who will transform you day, from, day by day, who will take you from glory to glory. And if that's you in this place and you're like, I need this, man. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of living this, this undisciplined, selfish life, trying to fulfill my own, my own pleasures, my own wants. I want this. I want to be changed. All it takes is a simple confession saying, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Would you wash me clean? Would you change my heart? Would you fill me with your spirit? And would you lead me in this life day by day? That free gift of eternal life and transformation is for you today. So if that's you, the, the request is simple. I'm gonna ask you as the band is playing to come up here right in front of the stage if you do, there's gonna be a whole lot of celebration in this house because we want this for you. We want you to experience God's best for your life. And I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer, a prayer of confession saying, God, forgive me, change me, and lead me in this new life. And you will leave here today a new creation. So church, be praying for those individuals. If that's you, come up as the band is playing. Ben, take it away. sing anymore, but if there's anybody, if there's even one person, if there's even one person who says, you know what? I don't even really fully know what I'm stepping into, but I need this. You just feel the tug. You feel your heart just, it's like you're being drawn to this, but you're like maybe stuck in that seat, concerned about what other people around you are gonna think about you. Be consumed with what God thinks about you. He loves you. He has more thoughts about you than there are grains of sand on the earth. He's committed to you. And he just, he's warning you in this moment, hey, don't go down that path any longer. It leads to destruction and I have a garden of life for you. But would you humble yourself before me? Would you recognize me as your savior and as your king? and he will change everything in a moment. Is there anybody, anybody in this auditorium that says, you know what, that's for me. Just want you to come forward. Anybody else? Amen. Well, for those online, maybe there's somebody online right now and you're hearing this message and you just caught the tail end of this maybe and your heart is pounding and you're, and you're, you're recognizing that the word of God, the truth is bearing witness with your spirit. And you're like, you know what? I wish I was there in person. Can God lead me into his throne room, even through a screen? Yes, the Holy Spirit is accessible even where you're at right now. And so the, the simple prayer that I wanna invite you to recite after me is this. Say, Lord God, I recognize I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that Jesus died on a cross for me and paid for my sin in full. And I believe that he raised himself from the grave 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I choose today to turn from my own selfish ways and to follow Him. Fill me with your spirit. Change my desires. Give me a new heart. And give me power to walk this thing out. From this day forward, I'm yours. Now lead me in a life of love for you and to bless a ton of people. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give it up for those online who are receiving forgiveness. Now, a simple call to action for you is on your screen. You're gonna see a QR code. If that was you and you made that decision, please scan that QR code. We wanna be able to support you and equip you in this amazing journey. Church, thanks so much for supporting today. God bless you all. Thanks, Kevin.